Peter Ridgway is a conservation ecologist specialising in conservation and restoration of the threatened Cumberland Plain region. He advises government, community and private land managers to develop and manage conservation initiatives with a focus on threatened species and ecological community recovery, bushland conservation and invasive species management. Tonight, sorry, Tonight, Peter will present on the diverse range of projects that are helping wildlife survive against the pressures of land clearing, climate change and natural disasters, all illustrated with photos and videos. This talk is quite topical uh, with considerable local interest as OFF has recently been working with Peter, administering a grant from the International Fund for Animal Welfare on a project called Water for Wildlife. A couple of our members volunteered to purchase and deliver materials for the watering stations to the Cumberland Land Conservancy property at Mulgoa. So I'll now hand over to you, Peter. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. A big thank you to Adrian and to Kim who've navigated this uh, whole process and IT. So hopefully we'll be able to stick through it um, today. Um, perhaps Kim, if you can give me a thumbs up that you can still hear me. All good at your end? Yep. Okay, wonderful. We'll jump in. Look, I'm really excited to be talking to you all tonight on two topics that are quite close to my heart. Uh, the Cumberland Plain, or, or Western Sydney as you might know it, um, and native wildlife recovery. To give you a quick uh, idea of the outline today, um, I'm going to first give you a very, very brief uh, introduction to the woodlands and the woodland fauna uh, of the region and also regards to the decline of, of native species. And then I want to focus on four particular issues and the projects that we've been uh, running um, as a community to address them. And I'll, I'll stress, I do have a government job, but today is, is very much a personal presentation about community programs. Um, those four being um, looking at woodland age, um, climate change and, and urban heat island effect, fire and drought, and the impacts of roads and the loss of corridors. So to jump straight in to the Cumberland Plain, the best way to get an idea of where the Cumberland Plain is, is to look at a map, um, a map of vegetation, a map of national parks or even an air photo. And the uh, Cumberland Plain is really the, um, the hole in the donut of Sydney. You can see here uh, the ring of green that surrounds Sydney, uh, most of it National Park, which is in lime green on the maps that you can see in front of you. Uh, and in the middle of that is this um, crescent shape um, of land, um, which we call the Cumberland Plain, most of it being relatively flat um, and shale country. And I've highlighted some of the key uh, bushland areas in that region in red. And you can see just how extensive the land clearing of that region is. The Cumberland Plain is basically the landscape that isn't conserved. This is a fairly depressing map, it's not our friend, but the Cumberland Plain is so much more than just a depressing story. So what exactly is the Cumberland Plain? So the 22nd version of the geography and geology of the region. Basically the Cumberland Plain is all the good land. It's the land that was largely responsible for feeding the Darug, Gundagara, uh, and in parts of Darawal people. Um, and it also for keeping the Sydney colony alive until uh, the passage over the Blue Mountains was achieved. It's surrounded by sandstone geology in the main, um, but for the most part, it's shale geology. And this really fundamentally shifts um, not only the species that are present, but also the ecosystem and how that ecosystem functions in relation to the sandstone. It's a very different landscape to what Sydney siders consider to be the natural environment, to be the bushland. And it does take a considerable shift in perspective to understand um, how this ecosystem works. Uh, much of the ecosystem in terms of diversity and also in terms of ecosystem function occurs on the ground. So instead of the sandstone country, which is dominated by fairly close trees in most parts, um, dense shrubbery in most areas, um, and the dominance of sandstone, particularly in terms of fauna habitat, the Cumberland Plain is for the mo most part open, grassy woodland. Uh, I will make a caveat there. Most of what you will see if you go to visit a patch of Cumberland Plain woodland in a reserve is indeed grassy, uh, 
but a more accurate description of this ecosystem is actually a flowery woodland. Most of the diversity and most of the vegetation cover in those very, very small number of good remnants is in fact flowers rather than grasses. Um, so I've chosen quite deliberately the image here, um, which is probably more representative of, of what to think of in terms of the Cumberland Plain uh, than what you will see in many of the photos um, to come. As a result of the geology, the wildlife of this region is for, uh, is for the Sydney region very unique. And it looks a lot more um, similar to our conceptions of the Western Plains than it does to Sydney. Um, this is what we anticipate to see travelling west uh, out past Bathurst, um, large flat areas, grassy, uh, and with large macropods like emus, uh, macrofauna like emus running around. In fact, the photo you're looking at in front of you was taken a couple of years ago at Penrith, looking at a wild population of emu in fairly intact native grassland. Uh, many of the wildlife species here are unique for Sydney and again, generally speaking, more representative of the Western uh, districts. And you can understand many of these species again by thinking of the structure of the vegetation and the dominance of woodland rather than forest. So all of you should hopefully be aware of brown tree creepers. You can go out and see these lovely birds in, in most Sydney reserves. Uh, sorry, white, white brown tree creepers. Uh, in the Cumberland Plain, in those areas of good habitat, at least in the south, uh, these are replaced by brown tree creepers, uh, which are more dominant on logs on the ground. Um, there's simply more logs to hunt on, on the ground than there are vertical uh, tree uh, stems. Um, and so here we effectively have a horizontally feeding tree creeper rather than a vertically feeding tree creeper. Uh, other species substitutes, um, here we see sugar gliders, which um, you can find in almost any, uh, even some of the quite small bushland reserves around Sydney. Um, and in, again, good habitats in the Cumberland Plain, these are largely replaced by the much larger sugar glider, a uh, squirrel glider. Looking at the macro, macropods, uh, species you'll be familiar with, um, the swamp wallaby here, which is a browser rather than a grazer, so it's um, in natural competition, it's dominantly feeding on native shrubs. Um, in the Cumberland Plain, that species, instead of being the dominant species, as it is in the sandstone habitats, is generally restricted to the creek lines. And on the fertile Cumberland Plain woodland soils, it's replaced very rapidly uh, by the eastern grey kangaroo, which is a browser, uh, feeding dominantly on grasses. Uh, and in the more marginal country by the common wallaroo. Um, this is a sexually dimorphic species. So on the right hand side, you can see the, the male and on the left, one of his female. I couldn't possibly even start to cover uh, an introduction to the fauna of the region, but I hope that these couple of examples have given you a bit of a taste uh, of what the, the native fauna are like and, and how they differ uh, from the sandstone species. I don't want to spend uh, too much time on the doom and gloom, so very quickly going to cover uh, what has been happening to fauna species in this region. Um, you may have heard of the terms defaunation or empty forest or empty woodland syndrome. Uh, and this is a very apt way of summarising what's happened. We have lost a considerable number of species um, in the region, so we've lost our diversity. Um, but the focus on biodiversity loss perhaps masks a much bigger loss, which is the loss of abundance, the collapse of ecosystems um, and the decline of native species into very, very small numbers indeed. Um, despite some things you may see, uh, and here, even at a state scale, um, we have a limited number of species that are in imminent risk of extinction as a species. It's quite easy to maintain a species with a few breeding pairs in one area, and that's what the government is really focusing on at the moment. The huge crashes that we've seen in New South Wales are largely to do with abundance. If we consider koala, it's very unlikely that koala will become extinct in the wild in the next 20 years. What has happened and is a far greater catastrophe is the sheer volume of decline in the abundance of koalas and in the number of sites they're present in. So those are the trends that we're seeing in the Cumberland Plain in fauna. The reasons are fairly self-explanatory. Uh, this is a photo from a few years ago, although anyone driving down Northern Road at Badgerys Creek 
we'll see similar scenes. We lost well over one square kilometre of habitat in a single day uh, last week at Badgerys Creek through land clearing. So the scale of loss is absolutely monumental. This is a, an alternative way of looking at that, um, that carnage. Uh, this is the map showing the boundaries of, of the Cumberland Plain, uh, largely the, the shale soils um, uh, in red here, uh, looking at existing urban areas which are blacked out um, and areas that have already been approved for land clearing in grey. So those areas that have been already approved for clearing but have yet to be cleared constitute at least a third of the entire landscape. Uh, behind that, the uh, fairly obvious uh, driving factor um, is increasing rates of population growth. So that's not just simply increasing population, but an increasing rate of growth, um, of which close to a third of all um, immigrants into Australia now move into the Cumberland Plain region. Uh, and at the wildlife end, the result is a corresponding decline in abundance. The graph here, this is from the ABBS data, uh, for a species um, called speckled warbler um, and shows the decline between the 1960s and the present in abundance for that species. But I've actually cheated here. This is not simply a graph of decline. This is a graph showing the decline within the reserve estate for that species. And I wanted to stress that as an example to show that what is happening in this landscape is happening at a landscape level. Um, and the small reserves in the region um, are impacted much more by what's happening outside them than by what's happening inside them. So I'm not going to obviously talk about uh, population and uh, political issues tonight. Um, so really focusing on a fourth key themes of uh, areas where we can, through practical works, um, recover wildlife and four key issues uh, and I want to stress that these are specific to the Cumberland Plain. Um, so many of, of what we're presenting here um, is not the case in the sandstone country. And the first I want us to raise is an issue that is, is not generally um, uh, known outside our region, um, and it's a problem with vegetation age. Uh, if you um, go back after this talk and, and have a look about Cumberland Plain woodland and decide to head out to a reserve, um, you're likely to see something that looks fairly similar to this. Um, in this case, uh, we're looking at a revegetated area, but most of our naturally regenerating areas look fairly similar, quite dense uh, tree uh, cover, very, very little uh, wood on the ground and reasonably good canopy cover. So it's uh, fairly, well, um, fairly well covered, fairly well shaded. As it happens, we have data which fairly conclusively tells us a, a very different story about the ecology of the Cumberland Plain. Um, I'll start with a, a historical uh, means of looking at it. Um, in terms of tree age, it's quite easy, uh, relatively straightforward to have a look at uh, age of the trees in the region. Um, this is a photo from 1913 um, of St Paul's at Cobbety, and you can see the tree in the right hand side, which is still there, um, and that's the same tree in place today. And, well, getting some interference in there. You can see that the tree has, has thickened somewhat in the last 100 years, but has really barely grown in that period of 100 years. And by studying numerous trees um, across 100 years of growth in the Cumberland Plain um, and measuring those growth of the trees um, over time, we can put together curves for each species and for different uh, landscape positions, looking at the rate of growth. So here we're looking at a graph that shows um, it's logarithmic, so it, it comes out in a straight line, but it's a, uh, a growth curve, showing the estimated age of trees by their diameter, um, and also showing the error margins. You'll note that as you get larger, that is as you get older, the margins of error um, increase. So if you have a look at the age though, a tree, uh, this is rough barked apple and Gophrys subvelatina in, in traditional Cumberland Plain woodland. By the time it reaches one meter in diameter, it's anything from about 200 to about 450 years of age. That's a very significant age for a tree of that size. This is very different growth to what we see in the sandstone habitats. Now, that's impressive figures, 
What I now want to show you is what impressive trees in the Cumberland Plain look like. So if you recall the small trees outside Camden, which we can now confirm are between 250 to three or 400 years in age, you then look at the mature trees that we have on private properties across the Cumberland. Uh, this is one of my favourites. This is one very old tree. And I've phrased that very deliberately. This is one tree uh, which has lost its centre. A little bit difficult to appreciate in a two-dimensional photo, but this is a single trunk, the middle of which has rotted away. Um, just behind it, um, to give you an example of some other trees um, in similar condition, this is the blue box about 20, 30 metres away from that tree. Um, again, a single trunk, one side of which has fallen over. So this is a landscape where allowing natural processes to proceed, trees become very, very old indeed, um, but also individual trees become, reach quite considerable dimensions, particularly in terms of width. This tree here has a canopy reach of 12.5 metres. For a single tree and it's in a patch of about 40 or 50 trees of quite similar dimensions. The closest thing we have to um, a reference site so to speak for Cumberland Plain Woodland, a site that we can look at and consider is relatively untouched is Crown Reserve 30. This is in the Burrograng Valley which um, some of you may have heard all about uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and indeed, this is one of the sites which will be partially or completely flooded by the raising of dam wall. Um, Crown Reserve 30 is a small patch of woodland that was set aside for timber purposes and then never used. Um, and subsequently, the valley was um, flooded with the first dam and around Crown Reserve 30 has grown a continuous growth of grey box woodland. You're looking into the reserve here at the edge of the reserve and you can see the growth of young saplings in the distance. Crown Reserve is a great example allowing us to see what the difference between remnant and regrowth in, in grey box woodlands looks like. And it's a remarkable change. If I show you some figures for those who prefer a graph, uh, we're looking at here in blue, I've shown trees within the Crown Reserve and in red, the trees in surrounding um, habitats which were either grazed or indeed harvested for um, firewood. Uh, you can see that in the Crown Reserve, the number of trees per hectare is extremely low. Um, in those areas that have been thinned, somewhat ironically perhaps, um, the, the growth is now much higher. Uh, on the right, you can see that the trees in the Crown Reserve are obviously of much greater diameter. But I want you to focus on the two bars in the middle, which show that in the Crown Reserve, you have just over a kilometre of logs on the ground per hectare. I'll repeat that. So there's over a kilometre in length of logs, anything over 10 centimetres diameter, um, per hectare. Um, this is compared to at best three or 400 um, metres of logs elsewhere. Likewise, the number of hollows is more than double the surrounding landscapes. When we understand this, it gives us a very different perspective on what the problems are in our remnant woodland. Uh, what we're doing in most of the landscape is this which is really a view of two problems. First problem in the distance being the house and the second problem in the front being very, very dense revegetation. This is not habitat which brown tree creepers or emus or indeed any of the other native species which are endemic to the plain um, benefit from. What are the solutions? One of the solutions that's been particularly effective in our region is restoring woody debris on the ground. It's as simple in practicality as it has been difficult in, in politics and logistics. Um, we need to stop mulching trees and start putting hollows on the ground. Since almost all our vegetation, particularly in the uh, reserve system, is very young, is very thick and has almost no um, wood on the ground, our national parks have less than, in most cases, less than 100 metres of wood debris on the ground. Uh, we desperately need to put logs back. And I want to hopefully show you a little video um, of one of the community programs that has been doing just that and then present you the, um, the results. So fingers crossed, you should be able to watch the video in a video now. <laughs> 
many people are aware that small mammals still exist here in the Hunan Plain. Um, they exist in the Carol, there's not many of them left. Um, they're close to extinction and um, we saw a need, um, a need to provide um, opportunity to them. So today's project was about restoring rocks, um, which is their primary habitat in woodland areas. For the small mammals, our target species for today was um, the little antichines and the oval. So these are two uh, little marsupials that uh, need uh, hollow rocks to be able to set up homes, uh, to be able to uh, get themselves away from danger, uh, to be able to survive a bushfire. So, you know, they need somewhere to run and to be able to buy fire and come to. And I guess um, that was one of the reasons why we were turning these logs is there's so few left on the Cumberland Plain and there's many reasons for that. Um, one of the costs, one of the first reasons is that we need to become a society with most all the vegetation. And uh, we've used um, we used the logs that were left on the ground for firewood, and uh, we've also had uh, you know, in situations whereby any logs that might have remained in that nature seems like long gone. Hopefully we'll have be able to hear the audio on that. Um, so that's just a, a little field clip from uh, one of the programs. Um, to date, we've shifted just under uh, a thousand uh, tonne of logs in the Cumberland Plain, uh, which sounds quite impressive, but is very uh, a drop in the ocean um, on the scale, which, you, which we ultimately need to um, achieve. Um, it raises an obvious question. Well, what results have these programs had? Um, the, particular graph I want to show you today, which I think is probably the most um, revealing in terms of the impacts of these programs. Um, this shows you the abundance of Cumberland Plain land snail um, in those areas where we've added and, and haven't added logs. So on the left are sites which are, uh, have received additional logs and on the right are sites which have not received those additional logs. And you can see that the population um, of Cumberland Plain land snails are greatly impressed. Now, who cares about a snail, you might say? Well, despite firstly being an endangered species. The reason I wanted to show the results for that species is that snails are in the Cumberland Plain one of the keystone species at the base of the food chain. Um, many, many of the threatened bird species which live in the region feed on snails um, and the snails are also feeding on the fungi which is the primary food source for many other invertebrates. So by restoring these hollow logs we're massively increasing the fecundity for want of any uh, better word of the ecosystem and increasing all the really most of the fauna species um, which rely on it. So we're rebuilding the, the ecosystem from the bottom up. 
The second, the second um, oh, I think we've got someone with, with who needs to go on to mute. We've got some echoes there. How's that? I think that's a bit better. Okay, uh, the second area I wanted to talk about was uh, changing climate, um, both urban heat island and climate change. Uh, hopefully there's no one tonight who uh, I'm sure I need to explain climate change to, um, but you, some of you may be less familiar with urban heat island effect. And it's urban heat island effect, which I, I want to uh, focus on here, because that is overwhelmingly the major problem that we're dealing with for the Cumberland specifically. Um, I'll show you a graph that quickly explains that. This is a graph um, of days over 30 degrees Celsius, so basically a, a graph of hot days um, between 1960s and the present. Um, and you'll see the, um, the harbour, the CBD, in, in grey there. Um, coastal Sydney has experienced perhaps 0.3 or so degrees warming per decade for the last few decades. That's climate change. That's a global change impacting the Harbour City. Um, that's quite devastating. Um, that's a degree of climate increase um, per, you know, per human generation, effectively, of one human lifetime. Um, however, I want you to look at the orange and the red lines on this graph. Um, you can see the rising number of days um, rising very steeply for Western Sydney. And if we talk in other terms, we've seen about three or four degrees rise in the last decade alone in average maxima in Penrith. So in, the, in my lifetime alone, the average maximum temperature in Penrith in summer has risen seven degrees. This is enormous climatic change for a local area uh, and the impacts on people have been very significant. The impacts on wildlife have been deadly. Uh, this is a heat map. Um, basically, this is an infrared photo um, from the air showing the Penrith local government area. You can see the bushland areas here. This is in February 2011. Um, so bushland areas of London area in Mulgoa, which is sitting at about 32 degrees Celsius. You can see the more urbanised areas sitting at about 45 degrees. Uh, one of the things that's less obvious on this map is that those heat sinks are not restricted to those areas covered with concrete, which are the cause of urban heat island effect, but that effect is leaching into the adjoining bushland areas. Those bushland areas are heating up and they're heating up almost tenfold the scale that global climate change is warming them. Now, until recently, we had very, very little uh, idea on what impacts this was causing. Um, the first alarm bells for our region came through a program about two years ago I was doing with wombats. And up until about 2005, wombats were common in Cumberland Plain woodland, found in most of the large remnants. Today, they're not found in one. Since 2005, wombats have been exterminated completely from Cumberland Plain woodlands and are found now only in river flat forests where the temperatures are lower. Uh, this is the um, very complicated graph um, from which we uh, found out what was happening there. This is a graph showing in blue in the bars, you can see the, um, the activity rate of fauna in general. And in green and red, you can see the activity rates of other wildlife. And you'll see that when you hit 30 degrees Celsius in the Cumberland Plain, wombats simply do not leave their burrows. In fact, if you get enough nights where the temperature does not go below 30 degrees, the wombats will die of starvation in their burrows. It's that straightforward. Wombats have evolved in a, a continent which is both hot and dry, but in which the biggest issue is dry. And wombats have evolved without scent glands. This is fine. This is fine in desert environments because even in the hottest desert environments in Australia, the nighttime temperatures always shift below 30 degrees. Wombats can save um, their water, which is a much more precious resource, um, and afford not to have sweat glands. Unfortunately, today, much of the Cumberland Plain does not go below 30 degrees at night in summer, and wombats simply cannot survive. Um, more frequently, uh, 
seen in the media is the impacts um, of urban heat island and also of climate change on flying fox. Uh, this is a photo of the fatalities from the Campbelltown colony in 2018. Another species we've been monitoring locally is the greater glider. This is the largest um, gliding mammal in Australia, the second largest um, gliding animal in the world. Um, and they simply cannot tolerate heat. They are now extinct in the Cumberland region. Uh, this is showing you population of greater gliders in Golgoa Nature Reserve near Bent's Basin. Um, in 1982, they were the most common mammal in the reserve. Um, by 2017, they were rare, um, and by 2020, they're now regionally extinct, um, only found in the adjoining Blue Mountains areas. Um, list of species for you um, of those species on the left flora and on the right, uh, left fauna and on the right flora, which have been reducing due to urban heat island and climate impacts. That's the depressing side. What are we doing? Well, the primary species which has been benefited um, so far has been flying fox. We've had some amazing volunteer programs on hot days. We now have all but about two or three of our camps have volunteer groups who come out and spray the bats by hand with water during heat waves. We are now working on misting systems which will replicate this permanently, uh, which will have the advantage of reaching all the bats, not just those bats low down which volunteers can reach. And I'm hoping in a few months there will be an announcement um, of the first permanent um, flying fox misting system. This is very interventionist. Uh, but we are now at the point where if we do not intervene, we're going to see many of the fauna species in, in the Cumberland Plain simply disappear. Uh, we're regularly getting 50 degrees in the shade in the Cumberland Plain and it's not temperatures which fauna can generally assist at. Uh, an issue which needs no introduction tonight is, is that of fire and drought. Uh, and I wanted to raise this after the impact of urban heat islands. So, um, this will be uh, a, a rather a quicker one to go through. I also want to begin with a reminder of a point I raised at the beginning of the presentation, which is that this region um, is a particular drought and flood refuge for wildlife from a broader area. Every time we have a bad year in New South Wales, um, a number of woodland bird species, and in particular the charismatic region Honeyetta, move in considerable numbers into the Cumberland Plain because as a coastal grassy box woodland, it is a, a major drought and flood refuge. This makes a flood and fire refuge. This makes it all the more important for us to care for these species here. Um, similarly, if you look at animals, uh, this is a, a, a graph showing the travels of a koala. Um, many of our fauna species um, uh, seek refuge and indeed prefer to remain in the fertile shales of the Cumberland Plain than in the surrounding national park. So here you can see the koala moving over a process of two months. Um, this was Martin who was captured at, at Mulgoa. Um, and you can see just how well the boundary of the national park uh, represents the boundary of the less fertile, less suitable habitat for these species. Fire and its impacts is fairly well understood. I don't need to get uh, But first there's obviously the direct mortality. There's also considerable numbers of animals which survive the fires, but, uh, but don't have, need, need care in order to survive um, the immediate post-fire um, timeframe. And also animals outside the burn zone. Uh, in a perfect world where there was no land clearing, where our habitats were continuous uh, and there was no, wildlife, uh, no climate change, we would not have to worry, but in the current landscape, it's increasingly problematic for us to retain enough wildlife to repopulate our bushland areas. What's much less appreciated is the impact of drought. Uh, this in front of you is a photo of drought. There's been no fire in this uh, particular area. Um, indeed, there hasn't been fire in there for at least 25 years. We are looking at the east facing slope um, across at the west facing slope of a ridge and you're looking at purely heat stressed vegetation. Uh, this is from the Blue Mountains in the last, fire, last um, drought season, um, which predated the drought. Um, very similar number of animals dried for, died from the drought um, in our local area as did died from the burns. It's a greatly underappreciated impact. So what is being done? Uh, the biggest single thing we can all do 
um, is providing water for wildlife. This is something that can be done by the community at a tiny scale, such as a bird bath. This is a, a great photo from a bird bath at Naram Yinji, um, showing just how many bird species and indeed the, the volume of birds, um, which were coming to water sources in the Cumberland Plain in, during the 2019-2020 fire and drought emergency. So here we've got yellow robins, scarlet honey eater, and New Holland honey eater, all at the one favour. Uh, as well as being something that can be done in the backyard, it's really important for large natural areas. We clearly need a different approach. And the key here is longevity of supply and scale of supply. Um, Oakley Flora and Fauna have been really great um, working with me um, and I4 and a number of other organisations um, providing large scale water stations, both for drought and also for fire relief. Um, these have been amazing. So the large water stations, they hold 20 to, to 50 or in some cases 70 litres of water. Um, they're deployed um, as far as possible into large bushland remnants. Um, this is one deployed near Agnes Banks for drought relief. Um, and we got well over 200 deployed in the 2019-2020 event and we're hoping for the region to have at least 500 of these stations deployed um, in future emergencies. The animals that benefit the most um, are the large animals that consume large volumes of water. So particularly the macropods, the eastern grey kangaroos in this case. Um, but you might be surprised on some of the other species which relied very heavily on supplementary water. Um, one of the biggest winners were kingfishers. Uh, we had large areas of the Greater Sydney region where there was no surface water. Um, for many, many kilometres for a considerable duration. And in many cases, one of the dominant species which benefited from these stations were kingfishers. They might not have been able to get any food, there were no fish in our water bowls, um, but they are species that are not well adapted at all to dry conditions. Um, we also had very large number of ducks um, making use of these water stations, again, because there were simply no other water bodies for them to use. Uh, actually, going back to uh, Agnes Banks, so this is a, a quick species list of species that we had using the Agnes Banks stations and gives you an idea of the diversity of fauna which have been using these. Um, it's been a real success. Um, unfortunately, not all the community initiatives um, during this period were su quite so successful. We had enormous problems with food being provided for wildlife and completely inappropriate food for wildlife. Um, in care, people may choose to give sweet potato to macropods, but it is a pretty much guaranteed way of killing a macropod in the wild uh, with a number of disease outbreaks, um, particularly lumpy jaw, impacting our, our macropod populations um, due to um, unauthorised but very well intentioned community food drops. So not quite so good. Um, the other issue we've had has been hay, which has been provided. And here you can see a lovely weed plume from a, water, a, a wildlife feed hay station. Um, and it's now left to volunteers to clean up those weeds. So the message from this is provide water and please do not provide food. Lastly, I wanted to introduce you to the works looking at saving wildlife. Um, and particularly around the issues of connectivity and roads. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the issues of, of road um, kits. You may not be um, fully aware of the scale of the problem. Um, so this is a, a map here of roadkill deaths for native fauna species um, over the, uh, and also deer for, for political reasons, um, over the last couple of years. And you'll see um, that there's been some fairly substantial rates of fauna loss um, for the Cumberland Plain region. Um, you'll also know that some, notice some individual species um, are particularly affected. Uh, one I'd bring to your attention is koalas in the southeast. Uh, we've lost probably uh, well over a hundred koalas in the last couple of years alone um, on the roads um, fringing the national parks um, around Campbelltown and Wallandilly. Um, this relates to the koala population trying very, very hard to recolonise from refugia in the national parks into the much superior habitat in the Cumberland Plain. Um, that process has begun to happen. We have wild koalas as far west now as Camden. Um, unfortunately, 
that is also areas which developers want their hands on and we're now looking at government programs to actually actively stop those koalas recolonise the region. Uh, positive works that we're doing, one of the most obvious is retrofitting um, existing culverts um, or indeed creating new culverts and, and fauna underpasses. Um, this is a culvert at Wentworth Falls, retrofitted as a wildlife underpass. Um, we've put native uh, natural soil, natural substrate in there, and a logs through the middle, providing what's called habitat furniture. By putting these, um, these changing the substrate between uh, underneath these um, culverts, um, it changes the behaviour of animals. Um, and this culvert, um, which hadn't been used by any native species for six months before works, um, within two days after putting um, soil and logs in, was being used quite regularly by wombats and other fauna. Unfortunately, this is fairly difficult and at times expensive work to do. Uh, another option which we've finally got started in this region is wildlife overpasses, um, sometimes called possum ladders. Um, they're equally used by, by glider species. Um, contrary to what you may read, they are not in general senses used by koalas. One koala using one once does not constitute a success. Um, so it's really important to understand that these measures are band-aid solutions um, and they certainly don't justify putting roads in the wrong places. There's really only a small set of species which benefit. Nonetheless, We've had some great success, particularly for sugar and squirrel gliders, in restoring connectivity and reducing roadkill um, by fairly, um, fairly cost-effective programs. Um, ultimately, of course, what we'd love to see is bridges like this. Just going to skip through to the um, last point I wanted to raise here, um, which I think is one of the more exciting um, of the programs, and this is working with wildlife carers to reintroduce fauna into new populations. So I mentioned that we've had koalas trying to recolonise the plain and the fact that they are now being actively stopped, uh, largely for because of development issues. Um, we also have emu in the Cumberland Plain which are actively being eradicated. But at the same time, community programs are working very hard to restore wildlife. Um, in the river flat forests, where we still have the ability to maintain wombats, we've been working with wires to look at whether we can use animals better um, when rehoming them. Most of the wildlife that comes into care comes from roads, either as road injured animals or as joeys in the pouches of road kill animals. So starting in 2015, um, we started with restoring a population of, I think it was 12, 13, 13 wombats um, to a private conservation reserve in Mulgoa to test out um, our ability to restore um, in a more intensive manner, wildlife populations. Um, we worked very hard on the preparatory work for this. We dug burrows um, for the wombats before they arrived, spread the individual wombat scats um, so that they were already in the bushland areas, um, eradicated foxes and other similar works. And we also monitored the result, the work very, very intensively. We had 160,000 wildlife images from our monitoring program on here, which Western Sydney University students assisted us um, in analysing. What was so wonderful was in restoring a wombat population to this property, we also found that the res restoration of ecosystem services increased the population of many other wildlife species. Some of those uh, were quite un unexpected results. Brush tailed possums did very well from the reintroduction of wombats um, through the provision of minerals. Um, brush tails, like other animals, um, do, where possible, geophage, which is to uh, effectively swallow soil to improve their digestion. You can possibly, hopefully, make out the uh, on the right-hand side a brush tail possum caught in the act of doing this. Um, other animals um, we found had major benefits from seeking refuge in wombat burrows from urban heat island and climate change heat. Uh, in particular, the macropods uh, were very, very heavy users of abandoned wombat burrows. Here you can see a little swamp wallaby. Um, and they're also used as nursery sites by eastern grey kangaroos who would take their young down an unused wombat burrow 
um, in order to let the joey go for their first steps out of the pouch. Um, in fact, the effect of the benefit of returning wombats was so stark that we even saw an increase in predators, um, such as lace monitors and also goshawks, as a result of the increased number of other fauna um, in the property where we introduced the wombats. Um, so here's a, a very, very gross summary graph looking at wildlife activity for native species um, in the portion of the property where we reintroduced wombats and comparing that to the portion of the property where we didn't. And basically we doubled the activity of other native wildlife species by the reintroduction of one species, the wombat. So I wanted to end on a little video um, showing this program, hopefully you can hear it. Uh, and I think it really captures the potential for restoration and indeed the really good work that we've seen in the last couple of years for this region. So a big thank you to you all for listening. Um, it's never quite the same on a, um, on an, a, when it's not face to face. Um, a big thank you to the very, very large number of people who've been assisting with all these wildlife recovery programs. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but um, either way, I've provided my contact details here. So if there's anything that we can't deal with today, I'm most happy um, to take any questions um, from people um, after tonight. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, that was terrific. Yes, we have got time for questions. And uh, looks like um, Sharon has a hand up on the, uh, on the participant list. So um, unmute your, ph your uh, phone, Sharon, and go ahead with your question. Hi, can you hear me, Kim? I can. Can Peter? And can Peter hear me? Yep, I can hear you loud and clear. Hello, Peter. It's Sharon Cullis. How are you? Good, Sharon. Good. <laughs> um, I've, I've heard you speak a couple of times, and each time I'm really inspired because you actually do manage to talk about fairly complicated things in really layperson-friendly ways. So thanks again for doing that tonight. Um, my particular question is, relates, obviously, to the koala population. In, um, in the Appen to Campbelltown area. I don't know whether you're aware, but there's a lot of excitement about the fact that koalas are popping up everywhere. They're moving eastward as well, and they're turning up at Engadine, which is well and truly off the Cumberland Plain. But um, right at the moment, I'm sure you're aware of this, uh, the RMS are about to turn Appen Road into, which at the moment is just, you know, single lane in both directions, into, um, a four lane highway and they're are really still mucking about with um, with the concepts of fencing along one side but not both sides of the road because what they're trying to do is to prevent the movement of koalas from the eastern side to the western side and as you'd be aware the koalas want to move west they want to move towards the mountains um, and they want to repopulate that more fertile country of the Cumberland Plain. Now, in terms, is there, what can lo local land services and, and yourself do to negotiate with the RMS? It's still not too late. And also lend lease to get some corridors. Well, the corridors are one issue, but the crossings, the culverts. Are you doing any work with lend lease and the RMS at, say, Narumba um, Reserve? or in Beulah Reserve? Because the culverts look really exciting, actually. The ones that you were actually introducing furniture to. Sorry the question's so long. 
can't hear the response now. Are you there, Peter? Hey, am I back? Yes, you're back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying, so tonight I'm going to speak um, just as Pete Ridgway citizen um, and specifically not mention um, any LS programs because that way I can actually just, um, you know, speak truth to power, so to speak. Um, so look, uh, the, the opportunities there are really difficult because what really needs to happen is two things. We need to allow the koalas to continue, they are already doing it, to continue to recolonise West um, without any interference. They are already um, in Camden, LGA, um, on the west side of the Nepean River, in fact. Um, and if nothing is done, they will very soon be breeding in there. And indeed, they will very soon be fairly abundant, I would suspect, within the next 10 years. They are, they are on the move, they're breeding very well, and they're going. Um, now, what we need, if that is to continue, is both um, a, a decision um, from government powers to not um, assist major suburban development in that region, and along with that, to allow for koalas crossing the road. Um, unfortunately, if the government continues in allowing subdivisions on the west side of the road, they basically are making true their claim that we need to put a fence up to stop koalas getting into there because it will be totally unsuitable habitat. So unfortunately, they're, they're, um, they're creating the conditions that they're claiming um, will be unsuitable for koala and using those to justify the fence, um, which is really the reverse process of where we need to be. So we need to have a solution on two levels there. We need to have a solution on maintaining habitat west of Appen Road and a solution on maintaining connectivity for koalas across that road. Um, at the moment, the fencing is in practice, if not in um, PR, is a fence to stop koalas getting west. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Adrian, you, uh, you've got a question. Adrian Polhill. Okay, thanks, Kim. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? Can you hear me, Kim? Yes, yep. Okay. Um, a little bit sure. louder, if you could please. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, That's better, yep. Thank you. Um, Peter, the map you put up there of the roadkill actually totally blows me away. But uh, my question actually is um, around the airport. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about what you've um, really what impact that airport going to have out there at Badger Creek and what, uh, what sort of protection have you um, heard of or you're planning to put in place to protect the remaining wildlife. Thanks. Yeah, uh, so look, so for, um, to be clear, so I was, I had a position at the um, Biodiversity Experts Group, which was meant to inform um, that program. Um, you can probably guess from my presentation the nature of the recommendations I made in that capacity. Um, I can tell you fairly straight that you can go on the website and see the result, which is that none of those uh, things that uh, that group recommended were implemented. Um, that's all up there on the internet. There's nothing, there's no secret about that. So the recommendations put to government were pretty much the exact opposite of, of what happened. Um, so in terms of Badgerys Creek Airport, to our knowledge at present, there's no plan to retain any habitat for wildlife um, um, excepting the uh, small area west of Northern Road, uh, which is an offset area. Um, they're currently undertaking the clearing and that's um, clearing from existing um, lightly treed woodland directly to sculpt bare earth. Um, and they are currently progressing at the rate of, for most days, around a square kilometre a day. So it'll only take them into next week, quite honestly, until they're completed. Um, the site is being fenced, um, so um, any wildlife is, is hopefully getting dislocated um, and, and displaced into other regions before that fence goes up. Um, but basically there will, in very soon, in a matter of days, there'll be no significant fauna left on that site. Um, and they're not retaining anything, so there's, there's not even area for, for birds of prey to perch or anything. Um, uh, further down the so so obviously that's a that's a huge loss. The the site is predominantly non-treed, so from a legislation point of view, only a small proportion of the site is considered vegetation loss. 
um, the entire site is habitat and, and covered was covered until very recently with wildlife. Um, the, um, the other huge issue though is what that site, which is largely going to be a, a couple of square kilometres of, of concrete, basically, um, what that is going to do to urban heat island in the Cumberland. So I've already said the average maxima temperature in Penrith has risen on official data by seven degrees Celsius in Penrith, seven. That's before any of that uh, one third of the region is converted to housing, as I showed you on those maps. That's current approvals already locked in. Um, and Badgerys Creek Airport being converted into concrete, we may well look down the path of 14 degrees Celsius rise. So we may be getting up towards, we're already hit 50 degrees official. Um, the official uh, weather station, by the way, for Penrith is not at Penrith. So that's not actually Penrith uh, temperatures there. That's Penrith Lakes, which is two or three degrees below. Um, so we're already hitting 50 degrees officially in Penrith. We may well, within the next 10 years, with the airport being built, looking at maximum temperatures of 55, pushing up towards 60 degrees within our lifetime uh, temperatures in Penrith. Um, how Nepean Hospital in particular is going to cope with that is something that it just simply isn't being discussed. Um, but um, very few mammal species and very few bird species can survive exposure to those sort of temperatures. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, the next question I've got listed here is from Brett and Deb in Maria Heads. Are you there, Brett and Deb? So slow. I can't unmute it. That's it. We can hear you now. Oh, can you? Yep. Oh, great. Sorry, yep. we've got really slow internet here, thanks to um, Malcolm Turnbull. Um, hi, Peter. I don't know if you recall, I used to work for um, National Parks or OEH, Deb Stevenson, and we did work together. You're doing a fantastic Okay, sorry. I think we've lost you, Deb. Um, sound's gone. Okay, you're back again. You can hear me again? Yep, yep. You, hmm. Your microphone's going in and out of mute, I think. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. I was going to do it all day. Okay, sorry, we can hear you now. Or I can. <laughs> um, my question, you said that um, the issue was not loss of species, but the loss in abundance, am I correct? Uh, uh, both of them are definitely, uh, both of them are definitely issues, um, but I think that we're not giving sufficient um, weight to the, um, the broad scale um, ecosystem losses, the loss of, divert, the loss of abundance, um, and really getting a little bit um, technical about just keeping um, species, um, you know, on the brink of extinction without letting them cross the line. Um, and uh, that's a fairly untenable situation for us to be in. Yeah, it seems to me the loss of abundance is just the, the step before the loss of the species from that particular region. So it seems really stupid, a stupid approach to me. Yeah. And just another question, because I haven't worked in, in Western Sydney for, for um, nearly six years now, but what's the connectivity like there now? Uh, is it, it must be much worse than it was before in terms of species trying to move, not just the koalas, but species trying to move to habitat that's more suitable as the temperatures rise. Yes, so look, in the northwest and southwest, the actual connectivity is still actually very, very high. Um, and in other regions, it's taken a very significant hit. Um, vegetation mapping is not particularly informative on that. So where we've got large lots that are fairly um, underused from an agricultural perspective in the Northwest and the Southwest, even though there's not a lot of treed connections, we are actually tracking wildlife very effectively moving through the landscape because there's limited domestic dogs, there's limited uh, cattle, um, and most areas are still um, derived native grassland with scattered trees. So in the northwest and southwest, we've actually got excellent connectivity. Um, in other regions though, um, particularly the central east, um, Campbelltown, 
and increasingly around Erskine Creek and, and those northwest um, growth centres, the connectivity values have severely um, altered and we've seen a lot of species drop off in those regions, even though there's reserves in many cases established for them, um, we've seen some fairly rapid um, disappearance of species from those landscapes. As soon as the connectivity goes, the reserves are simply too small. Um, particularly when we start losing the macrofauna, so grazing species like kangaroos, we tend to see a whole heap of other species start to fall out of the mix as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks Deb. Um, I have no other questions on the, the chat line or with a hand up. Uh, does anybody want to jump in? Um, we've got a couple more minutes. Up to speak. Okay. Who's there? Anybody jumping in to ask a question? If not, I'll. Oh, there it is, Matt. Matt. Matt Allison. Go ahead, Matt. There, you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Um, Peter, I was just interested in in your passion, where why you chose Cumberland woodland to to, um, to study and to um, to try and save. Uh, what what was your influence there? You mind me asking? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's um, a question I get. It's it's not an easy task to take on. Uh, look, I, I think partly I grew up in the region. I grew up near East Hills in Cumberland Plain woodland, so it's the vegetation. Um, the landscape that I knew from that time. Um, and um, partly I enjoyed the challenge. I saw that there were relatively few people working in that landscape despite all the, the issues it had. And, and so I saw a real need for people to um, choose that landscape and, and work exclusively in that landscape, learn as much and, and hopefully have as much impact, uh, beneficial impact on that landscape as possible. So it was a, certainly a hard one to take on, but when I, um, when I started working um, in the field, um, had the opportunity to choose uh, a region to work in. I, I said that that was the region I wanted to take on, um, and I've stuck with it uh, for the 15 years uh, since then. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Bert. Um, over to Graham F. Graham Fry, you have a question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kim. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Peter. That was a wonderful presentation. Very, uh, a little bit depressing, but very interesting as well. Um, a friend of mine has been running a long-term bird banding study at Mount Hannon, and he's started there before it actually was, became a garden. And Alan's got a terrific data set there of the birds which uh, use the area. In recent years, the, the uh, gardens have removed the weedy understory of olive and opened it up and perhaps made it more a traditional woodland uh, habitat. The problem is, as we've seen it here locally, that noisy miners and bell miners have moved in, in abundance since it's been opened up, with the result that, of course, the all the little bird uh, has disappeared and the general population of other species has crashed. My concern is with woodlands and, and your proposals or your plans of opening up and putting the logs on the ground, are we not creating a lot more noisy minor habitat and then the brown tree creepers and other species will also suffer? Sure, that's a really good question. So thank you. Um, so, so first of all, um, to, to rule out bell miners. Um, so bell miners are really um, only come into most areas except the fringes of the Cumberland Plain since the olive has come. So in fact, the bell miners should uh, definitely be uh, disappearing once that olive is is removed. That sometimes requires a regional approach, and um, in some cases also requires the trigger of a burn. So um, we actually had a section um, at Cobbity where we completely eradicated African olive um, and the bell miner colony uh, for a whole region of Cobbity, um, but the bell miners stayed and they stayed until we did a HR burn to basically deliberately piss them off. Um, and then they left and never came back. So the bell miners should be um, effectively a species that disappears in the, with the control 
um, of olive in the long term. Um, the noisy miners is a much more difficult problem. Um, and the, the birds are a good way of thinking of a problem that we now face in the Cumberland. Um, many of the birds that, we're, that now persist in the Cumberland Plain persist because of weeds and they're predominantly sandstone habitat species. Um, so bell miners, um, bowbirds, um, which were never part of the woodlands themselves, only ever dry rainforest and single habitat. Um, so we, and we don't necessarily have good populations of woodland birds to replace them. And that's where noisy miner comes in as, a, as an issue. Um, I've always found it interesting calling them noisy miner because if you go to the Pilliga, they are scared, silent little things that you've got to try hard to find because there's so many predatory woodland birds that they are simply not noisy miners at all. They're a, a, a minor species in the mix. Sorry, poor choice of phrase. They're a very small, very rare bird in the mix because of the health of the other birds in that ecosystem. Where they come into their own is in the absence of good predatory birds um, and that's when they really take over. And one of the um, situations where they take over like that is in fact where the woodland is too thick because predatory birds can't prey on them. Mm. So while, while they certainly will increase when the olive's removed, I think that that's um, a largely inevitable part of the process of at least opening up habitat for other species. We have seen at Mount Annan an actual decline in bird diversity because at the end of the day, there's less na native woodland specialists than there are generalist birds or birds that appreciate the olive. But I think that we're better restoring the ecosystem to some semblance of its natural state um, than having an ecosystem which is entirely exotic, which is what the olive is, is ultimately going to um, derive. But it's really, really challenging, really challenging issue for us at the moment. Uh, thanks, Peter. That's very good. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Sharon, have you got a quick one? Yeah, but it's pretty quick. Um, I know the more bank intermodal. Um, can you hear me, actually? Yes, we, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. The Moorbank Intermodal, which is only, you know, 25 minutes upstream from where we are here in, in Oatley, also involves something like um, two square kilometres of hard stand alongside the Georges River and is involving the clearance of um, endangered ecological communities like River Flat Forest. I'm wondering whether Peter might comment on the impacts of that and whether or not he's aware of what fauna might have been in that area, how many hollows were in that area, and what the impacts of that's going to be. Sure, so, um, so there's a couple of issues um, that I'm aware of there. Um, so um, actually one to add to the list, um, which, which I have raised in a, in a personal capacity, I don't have any work um, relation to this project, um, is the issue of biosecurity. Um, an intermodal is basically the spot where you will have a team, well, you should have a team, um, pretty much 24 seven removing all the exotic species um, which turn up. Um, Sydney Airport has a dedicated biosecurity um, presence um, and most smaller institutions do. You do not, generally speaking, cite these on the edge of very large bushland areas because you invariably end up with very, very nasty um, new incursions of pest plants and pest animals. Um, in particular for more back into modal, the ones that are, are, are on the radar list at the moment would be um, the, uh, uh, the Asian spiny toad, I can't remember the Latin name, um, which is being detected at, at Mascot very frequently um, and which would rapidly establish in uh, effectively the, the, the cold climate version of the cane toad and would very rapidly take into the climate and environment conditions of Holsworthy. Um, so that's a really, really big concern with an intermodal located right on the edge of that bushland area. Um, because when those things turn up, um, it's easy enough to eradicate them at Mascot. It's a very different question again in the middle of Holsworthy. Um, the other side in terms of biodiversity, um, less concerned in that location in terms of urban heat island, um, because you still do have a bit of a coastal breeze influence. Um, 
very concerned in terms of the biodiversity loss. Um, you do have koalas inside that facility. I know that when you drive past, you see barbed wire fences, but that's not the whole story. Um, so just to let you know that there are um, fauna accesses and egresses into there, and there are koalas presently in that facility. Um, and there's also um, the Hibertia um, Pumana um, situation with that property, which is a fairly, uh, one to Google afterwards, but a fairly um, terrible story in terms of the way um, endangered biodiversity has been um, assessed or, and um, considered or, or not considered at a development site. Um, if you have a look at Hibertia uh, Fumana. Okay, uh, thanks, Peter. Um, last question goes back to uh, Deb Stevenson. Are you there, Deb? No. Can you hear me? Okay, yes, now we can, yep. Sorry, we've got a very bad connection here. Um, just, uh, just interesting what you said about um, feed stations during drought periods. We've just had massive fires down here and we've lost a lot of our um, forest, forested areas. And WAS is putting out heaps of, of uh, water stations, but also feed stations. Is the message not getting out that, that, they, that they need to be careful about how they're, because there's so much sweet potato and hay and stuff that's been put out in these burnt areas now. Um, I'd hate, I hate to think of the impact that's going to have. Um, so the message isn't getting out to some of the care groups that they need to be very thoughtful about how they feed species. Yeah, look, that's that's one that could easily take um, a two-hour talk of its own. Um, one that I have actually been fairly heavily involved in. Um, when what the the short version is that um, the official stance um, and the advice um, coming from um, professionals and, and particularly from mental health, so the um, the wildlife wildlife health Australia. Um, who've, who've really taken the lead and should take the lead on this is Wildlife Health Australia. Um, at the beginning of the 2019-2020 fire season when volunteers began to do this in large numbers, um, it became apparent that um, there was going to uh, really only two options. One was to tell people not to feed anything at all and be aware that they were simply going to go and do whatever they liked or try and be pragmatic and recommend not feeding but provide advice on what to feed. And in the end, WIRES, Wildlife Care Australia, Wildlife Health Australia, uh, local land services, myself, um, and a number of other agencies in a working group um, ended up coming to the conclusion that it was going to be better to provide advice on what to put out um, because it was very, very clear that the community were not taking the, including WISE volunteers, were not taking their organisation's um, guidelines and were simply going and feeding anyway. Um, so we now have some, some uh, endorsed guidelines on what should be fed. Um, that's very much a compromise. Um, I'm not against feeding per se, um, but I would say that it's the consensus from that working group is that feeding has possibly had a net negative impact, um, which is a fairly, fairly horrible situation to be in. Mm. Um, so we really, really need people to, at absolute minimum, to start paying more attention to those guidelines. They've been very well distributed, um, but there are a large number of people who don't want to hear, um, including people who don't want to hear from the organisations they represent. So it's been a really, really difficult time with a lot of people wanting to do um, something to help, um, but being very resistant against advice on, on exactly what that needs to look like um, and, and having difficulty sourcing the things that they should be using. Oh, okay. I'll well, just to finish on a depressing note, Peter. Um, I, that was uh, a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it and uh, want to thank you very much. But I'd like to formally hand over to Graham Lalshare, one of your volunteers, um, to uh, give a, you a formal vote of thanks, Peter. Uh, Peter. Over to you, Graham. I'll share. You there, Graham? <laughs>
Can you hear me now? That's better. Yep, we can hear you now. I thought I had unmuted, but obviously not. No. Okay, go ahead. Yes, good to see you again, Peter. It's interesting to see what you do in your day job. Um, for your information, and you may have gathered this from one of the slides here, I have met Peter before, along with Vicky, when we helped with the water station project. And I should on the side thank Sharon for putting you in touch with us, and I'm glad that she did, and that we were able to help in that regard. But um, yeah, it's great to see what you do in your day job, as I said. And it's also good to see what local land services do. We hear about them here, but we don't always know what they do, particularly in the Sydney region. We see things about what they do in the country, but not so much in the city. So that was fascinating too. And I'm good to see the benefits and the, the benefits of the work that you do. It must be a... Uh, an enjoyable, frustrating job with a lot of um, negatives and hopefully more positives that can uh, outweigh them. But one of the questions that concern me and probably others watching this is how long can we keep putting people out in that area and expecting not to have consequences? I find it hard to believe that uh, people can survive, let alone, let alone the animals, or the flora in 55 degree days. So that, that's a real worry, I think. But to finish on a uh, good note, thank you for your very good presentation. And I hope we get to meet you again sometime. I'd like to be able to give you a, a usual gift that uh, we can't really do that virtually. Um, so thank you, Peter, and I wish everybody would put their hands together digitally and uh, Thank Peter very much for his great presentation.